I'm Martha Russell. I run the MediaX program at Stanford University, and MediaX is an industry-facing program that is a catalyst between the future issues of the business community and the current and future thought leadership that takes place at Stanford. We believe that a very important arena to understand and to study uh, is interactive media and games, and hence uh, this seminar series, which has been running for a number of quarters, so I'm really happy to welcome you here today. I have four announcements to make. In the role of Ingmar Rydal Cruz, the sign-up sheet is up here in the front. Don't forget uh, to sign in if you're taking the course. Number two, uh, MediaX is offering some travel scholarships for graduate students who are presenting papers at conferences, papers that deal with interactive media and games. So if you're working on a project, uh, doing some research, have proposed it to a conference, it's paper's been accepted, and you need some uh, travel funds to get you there so you can make the presentation, please uh, check out uh, the MediaX website, get information, contact me. Uh, we have uh, some funds that will help you get there. Second announcement is there's a call for proposals from MediaX, which is focusing on uh, the future environments for smart handheld devices. What will they be used for? Now, you're going to hear some ideas today at other seminars during the quarter. But uh, if you have a concept-proving project that you might like to explore over the summer, we are accepting proposals. Uh, for summer projects that will focus on the future context for smart mobile devices. You need a faculty member to uh, collaborate with you on the proposal, and the proposals are due in about two weeks, so you still have time. And the last announcement that I want to make is that on May 17th, that's a Tuesday, in Arriaga, MediaX will be having its 2016 conference. And here our focus is augmented personal intelligence. Who doesn't want that, right? And that's why you're here today. Uh, so this is detour, but it's not a detour. You're in the right spot. And I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, two very special people. Uh, Steve Rubin is an engineer at Detour. In his uh, Berkeley PhD, he worked with uh, Manish Agravala uh, in our computer science department now. And uh, he is building tools that are used in Detour. Louisa Beck is a producer at Detour. And after graduating from Berkeley, uh, she's had a wide variety of experiences as researcher, as educator, uh, as a producer, and as a web developer. Before she got into place, based storytelling. So you'll hear some stories, you'll hear about some tools, and I'm really happy to introduce to you Louisa and Steve. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and for having us. Um, so yeah, I'm Louisa. Um, I want to start by just telling you a little bit more about what detours are. So um, how many of you have taken a detour? Has anyone? Yeah? Um, so can you just like describe what, what, they, what they are or how you experience them? Yeah, um, so I guess briefly it would be uh, tours of cities or spaces that are done rather than through like a tourism board, it's done through either personal narratives or sort of architectural aesthetic experiences or it could be fictional narratives, different types of trajectories through space based on the story. Cool, and which ones have you done? Um, I did the, uh, the, uh, the radio lab one. Okay, cool. And, um, Gosh, the, the, I think it was a fisherman one in... in uh-huh, fisherman Okay, awesome. And then you, you said you did one too? No, no, okay. Um, so it's always really interesting to hear people describe them um, because they are audio tours, they are place-based. Um, but I want to I wanna show you a little bit about, um, actually, a little clip. So, yeah, so they're, they're location-aware audio walks. Um, they are, you listen to them on your phone, so you download the Detour app, um, and then your phone uses location to trigger audio content. Um, and most of you have probably taken maybe uh, some, some audio tour or another, uh, maybe at a museum, um, 
you might have, um, you probably got like, I have, have you guys taken museum audio tours, anyone? Yeah? Okay, so yeah, so you usually get some like ancient device that you then, you know, punch a number into and you're standing in front of the artwork and then a dude with a British accent starts telling you about how this work fits into post-postmodernism. Um, and, um, and so we're trying to create like a very, very different experience. We're trying to get people to get, to get outside, to put their phones in their pockets, and to listen to an audio tour that feels like you're being guided by a friend who is really excited to show you a part of their city or their neighborhood. Um, so, um, so this is, I wanna, we, we've made lots of different types of audio walks. So in all neighborhoods in San Francisco, um, in other parts of the world, some in New York City, some in um, Berlin and London and Paris, um, and, and we've also made, so we've made nonfiction, we've made fiction, we've made historical fiction, and this, this detour um, that I want to play you a little clip of is, was done in collaboration with a show called Radio Lab. and are you guys Radio Lab listeners, some of you? Um, and it's in, it's in Austin, um, and it's about a series of murders that took place in, in the 1900s, and you're guided by this ghost, or we call her like a smudge from the past, who takes you through Austin and, um, and talks about these murders. So I'm going to play you a little clip. Look around. You should be standing on fifth in front of a fancy suit jacket in the window of a little shop. This is dandies. If it isn't open right now, you can listen out here. But if it is open, don't just stand there staring. Go inside. If you see a little pig running around in there, that's Daisy. Welcome to dear Daisy. As me, she'd be tastier as bacon, but Wendy seems to like her as is. Let me know if I can help you with anything. You might see Wendy behind the counter. She and her husband, they own the place. Walk over to the counter and stand by the long glass case. Wendy and her husband like old things. See the cash register? We found this in an antique store for a steal. Um, it is from the 1800s and it starts at five cents and goes up to one dollar. Have a look inside the glass case full of things that can cut you up. What I really like are our antique razors. All of these are from the 1870s to uh, the early 1900s. I love that aged look that something has been through things. Um, and to be able to see that and just sort of wonder what it's been through. On top of the case, there's a row of bottles. See the black one with gold letters says Bay Rum? Open it up. Just be gentle. Oh, it's okay. When you won't get mad. Now hold it in your nose and take a nice big whiff. That's what everyone smelled like in 1885. That smell of clove and wet carrots. I had that smell in my nostrils the day we found Molly Smith. Old town pressed together, shoulder to shoulder, shoving each other out of the way, trying to get a look at a poor head. Blood just pouring out of it. Seems like everything changed when Molly turned up dead. I'll tell you Molly's story if you want. At least I'll start with Molly. Put that cat back on the bay room and come with me out the door and onto the street. Thanks for coming in. You give Wendy a holler when you need a suit. She'll make you something. All right, so I'll stop it there. Um, it's, it's hard to describe exactly what theaters are just from a video because they're so experiential. But I think that you can see from that clip that we try to get you to touch things, to smell things, and we use sound to like, enhance that experience or just to motivate you to try something. So in this detour, you end up going to the Austin Historical Center and you dig through old police logs like from, from the 1900s or from the early 1900s. And you, 
Um, and so you, you try to like follow this narrative, but we, we use that narrative to get you to experience the place. Um, so detours are very social, so you can actually, um, so, so your phone is in your pocket, but you can sync with friends so that you can all have the experience at the same time. Um, you can share audio and photos and snippets later on social media if you like. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more about um, why place-based stories are important to us. Because you might say, well, you know, you could, you could um, learn about Austin through documentary, you could read a book. There's many, many other forms of media. So why, why place-based stories? Um, we're very traditional storytellers in the sense that we look for compelling characters, we look for a narrative arc, we use rich descriptions and sound to create these emotionally evocative moments. Um, but place-based play, um, play stories let you do something else, which is they let you actually layer a story on top of a physical landscape. And they can show you the hidden stories of a place that you thought you knew. So, um, so one example of this is the Fisherman's Wharf detour, which um, most of you have probably been to Fisherman's Wharf at one point or another. It's the most visited tourist attraction in San Francisco. Um, there's tons of vendors and can, can be pretty overwhelming. But this, this detour shows you the working wharf. And you meet, uh, your narrator is, um, is Jorge, one of our producers, but also he introduces you to Candy, who's a fisherman who's um, worked there for like 40 years. So I'm going to play you also a tiny clip of that so you can get a sense for it. Um. Should be standing between Alley Others and Fisherman's Grotto number nine. Look for two glass doors that say passageway to the boats. They're next to a blue sign that says public access to the bay. Yeah. When you find those doors, go on through. The crab stand guys won't care if you need to squeeze past them. Lean up against the railing when you get to the other side. For this part of the detour, I'm going to introduce you to someone who knows this spot a little better. He's been pulling crabs from the bottom of the ocean since 1970. He's a commercial fisherman named Mike Mitchell, but everyone calls him Candy. Welcome to the lagoon. My name is Mike, but people call me Candy. Actually, my first nickname was Zip, like my dad. But when I got down here, there was an older Italian fisherman called Zip. So that was that. Eventually, someone started to call me Candy. Not because I like candy, which I do, but because I was a good guy. Sweet as candy, they said, and it stuck. I've been coming here almost every day for 40 years. So you're in my backyard right now. See the boats to your left? If I'm not out fishing, my boats will force slip from the front. She's called the Linda Noel, after my ex-wife. I've had that same space since 1980. So it's actually cool because sometimes when you go out there, you'll see Candy, Candy there in his boat. Um, and, and the detour takes you to the chapel that a lot of the fishermen go to. And it shows you this whole side of Fisherman's Wharf that like few people have ever, have ever seen or most tourists never experience. Um, so let's see, how do I? Um, so let's see. Hi. Another thing that detours I think are really unique for is they, they um, you can't really get much closer to having the experience of walking in someone else's shoes in this like very literal way. You're walking and you're listening to someone's story. And one of my favorite examples of that is the Castro detour that we did, which is narrated by Cleve Jones, who was one of the leaders of the gay civil rights movement and who worked closely with Harvey Milk. If you guys have seen the movie Milk, he's like the curly headed kid. Um, and so I'll play you just like a, one more example, and this is a, a little audio clip of, of the Castro detour. Hi, I'm Cleve Jones, and I'm standing here on a perfectly clear blue crystal day, and it was the Bay Bridge that brought me to San Francisco for my very first visit, and I just graduated from high school. I remember rolling down the windows and smelling the, the coffee and the ocean and the fog, and thinking it was the most beautiful that I had ever seen in my life. But the main thing was seeing gay people everywhere 
I went in the city, I saw people wearing shirts that said gay power, and I would see boys holding hands, and I knew at that point that I would had found my home, my, my real home. So that's the story I want to tell you on this walk. On the pillar there, you see the, the Plata Harvey, a gay bar with plate glass windows. When we were young and impertinent and stupid, this is our part. There once was a church that welcomed gay people. The first attempt to begin to educate about what we now call HIV AIDS. Hey, Morgan, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm sorry, I, I can't be walking around my neighborhood without running into people. I hope you're wearing your walking shoes. So, um, so that's like that's a little promo clip. But he, um, so he takes you through the Castro and, and tells you the, the history of, of this civil rights movement there. Um, and um, yeah, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the production process of creating a detour. Um, so one of the things we always think about this triad of finding a compelling location and a narrator who can give us an inside perspective on a place, and then finding a theme that maybe challenges your assumptions about that place, or that feels like an um, important topic in, in that neighborhood. Um, so we spend a lot of time as producers just hanging out in a neighborhood, like getting to know people, um, asking lots of questions, observing daily rituals, and working those into the story. Um, yeah, and just finding people who can, who can tell really interesting personal stories. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the writing. Um, my, my editors always said, say that like, the, the odds are kind of against you in a detour. Like You're trying to motivate people to get off their couches and to walk outside and to walk around for like an hour in a neighborhood that they don't know. So the writing has to be like super punchy, and you have to like create this sense of urgency throughout throughout the narrative. So, for example, we made a detour in the Western Edition in San Francisco, which, if you've been there, it's not it's not the most scenic neighborhood. Be, besides the the painted ladies, which are beautiful, um, but when you go into the Western Edition, there's um, it's it's not it's not a it's not a beautiful neighborhood per se. But, um, but we wanted listeners to, to feel excited about walking through the neighborhood. Um, so I wanted to just like give a brief example. This is just a little summary of some of the history of the Western Edition from Wikipedia. And would someone volunteer to just read this really quick out, li out loud? Yeah, go ahead. I used to live here. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> this Western Edition survived the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, but its Victorian style of building was largely after the Second World War, the Western Edition, particularly the Fillmore District, became a population base and a cultural center for San Francisco's African American community. Since then, urban renewal schemes and San Francisco's changing demographics have led to major changes in the economic and ethnic makeup of the neighborhood. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so it's, it's a pretty legit paragraph, right? Like it's a nice summary of, of, of the history and some of the things that happened. And there are like lots of great stories there. So there's an earthquake, there's, um, it's an African American cultural center, there's urban renewal schemes. So like lots of really interesting changes that we want to talk about in the detour. Um, but, but I want to just play you a little snippet of the introduction to this detour and like the writing that we use to, to get people really motivated to, to go into the neighborhood. So big changes here weren't gradual. They hit like seizures, an earthquake, a racist government pronouncement, a mass suicide. It was insanity. And it all happened to the tune of blues and jazz and church music and jam bands and punk and whatever is playing at the Fillmore Auditorium this week. That's the story I'm going to walk you through today. So let's get started. Yeah, so one of the goals is just to be really crisp in the language and to get people excited about going into, into places they, they wouldn't otherwise go to. Um, so another challenge we have as producers is finding a way to construct a story when the different places that we want to show people are spread apart geographically and they don't make any narrative sense. Like we have to construct a story that ties in these places um, 
but um, but yeah, but we don't have the the those choices that someone who is just writing a book or doing a TV series has. We can't always choose the order that we're going to introduce topics. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges we run into. Um, we think a ton about sound and how we can use sound design to to tell stories. So. Um, for example, this, there's one detour that we did um, which starts 25,000 years ago at the time of the mammoths and takes you all the way to today. It's based on a book called Cool Great City of Love by Gary Kamiya. Um, and, and so we have this intersection, Pacific and Columbus, um, in, in North Beach, and we want to try to give people a sense for the mammoths that used to be there. Um, and we use sound to do that. So, the first step, um, we actually use text, we use automated speech to test our detours. So we write and then we turn it into, or the platform that Steve is going to talk about turns that automatically into synthesized speech. Um, and then we test the detour and it sounds something like this. It's 25,000 years ago. It's very quiet, but in the distance, you hear some curious thoughts. Now the ground begins to shake. The next step is the, the narrator comes in, um, in this case, Gary Kamiya, um, and we do voiceover recordings with him, and it sounds like that. 25,000 years ago. The city is gone. It's very quiet. But in the distance, you hear some curious thoughts. Now the ground begins to shake. But it's still kind of hard to imagine because you're standing at this intersection. Um, so then we, we use lots of sound and I want you to just pay attention to the sound design if it helps like close your eyes like that's when it helps me imagine it but I, I'll play this next bit for you this is the final the final product it's 25,000 years ago the city is gone where the yellow brick building was is now a muddy pond it's very quiet but in the distance you hear some curious thoughts. Now the ground begins to shake. Look toward the rumbling, down the street or on, away from the busy intersection. And they appear, three Colombian mammoths running toward us at full speed. Their tusks are 15 feet long. Look up to the second story of the Pansini building. That's how tall they are. So don't just stand there, hide right here by the little grove of trees. Okay, by the brick wall right next to us. <laughs> All right, so we use lots and lots of interesting soundscapes. Um, and we think a lot about how the sound and how the music can progress throughout the story. So we try to plan to get enough music to cover a range of emotions. And we, we think about music in the same way that um, people who are working in film lots of times do. And um, yeah, and let's see, I think, I think that's all I have. Yeah, so now Steve's going to talk a little about the technology that we're developing to make detours. Thanks, Louisa. Um, so hopefully by now, Luisa is motivated to you why we're interested in telling place-based stories. Um, and hopefully you, you've also kind of got the understanding of some of the challenges that there might be in making uh, these tours. So I'm going to talk about what we're doing at Detour, um, the technology that we're building to make it easier for producers to make these kind of tours. So the production process is broken into three main components. We have word processing, mapping, and audio editing. So producers will write several drafts of their detour script throughout the process. And as Luis mentioned, this is kind of like writing a screenplay. It will undergo several rounds of revisions and changes. And there will also be several people involved in the process of writing the script. So you'll have editors, you'll have other people who can contribute their own information to that process as well. Likewise, producers have to plan out the path for their detour. Again, as Louisa mentioned, the path will likely go uh, through several revisions based on how the story takes shape, um, the different landmarks that the producer wants to hit throughout the story, um, and so on. But there are also these other issues that the producer has to worry about when they're plotting their path. For example, 
uh, the producer has to be aware um, that in, for example, dense areas of cities with tall buildings, GPS becomes less reliable. There's also a lot of variability that the producer has to deal with in creating their path. For example, there's time variability with things like traffic lights. Uh, not every person is going to be you know, moving through particular space at the exact same rate. Some might be particularly fast walkers, while others are slower. And there are other kinds of variability too, um, aside from how fast people walk. So in the example that Luisa started with, showing part of that Austin detour where you walk into that uh, shop and you look around, well, that kind of requires that the shop is open. So what can we do to help people create tours that function even when not all of the indoor spaces or even some of the outdoor spaces are available at a given time? One sort of looming example of this is um, the Western Edition detour starts in Alamo Square Park in San Francisco, which in a couple months will be closed for the rest of the year. So what do we do to, to still make that detour a good experience even though the park is closed? So the final type of media in a detour is actually the audio, right? I mean, that's, at the end of the day, we need to deliver audio to the person who's walking through the space. So with this, the producer has all the normal challenges of audio production, which include finding the best takes in the narration and recorded interview footage, and also designing a compelling soundscape with ambience, music, and sound effects. When editing speech audio, the producer's goal is to make everyone sound as good as possible. But suppose your narrator, uh, as was the case when, we made a, when Luisa made a detour uh, about the Albany Bulb, uh, which is a park um, on the bay in Albany, which is just north of Berkeley. Um, and the person who's really giving us the best insight into this place um, is a homeless person who lived there uh, who has no teeth. So I'm just going to play a few clips of what some of his recording sessions sounded like. They all felt like gloomy enemies. They all felt like gloomy enemies. They all felt like gloomy enemies. So as I said, this is the guy who's really giving us the best insight into this place. And we want to use as much of his narration as possible in creating this hour-long detour. So obviously there's a lot of editing that we have to do. The producer, in this case, will spend days picking through tape, cutting and pasting, trying to make um, the audio sound as good and uh, comprehensible as possible. So with these three different tasks, the word processing, the mapping, and the audio editing, there already exist tools that really do these things well. You know, you have Microsoft Word and other screenwriting tools. Um, you have Google Maps, GIS, mapping tools, um, and then for audio editing, you have Pro Tools, Adobe Audition, other digital audio workstations. But in the process of creating a detour, these three tasks are really tightly intertwined. For example, each leg of a detour from any point A to point B, that corresponds to a certain part of the script. So maybe when I'm walking between those two arrows in Alamo Square Park, I want to make sure that the person um, gets this chunk of the story. And when editing together the audio for each leg of the tour, the producer has to make sure that she's putting the right amount of content in that section. If there's not enough content, the content will end before the person gets to where they're going, and they might hear this awkward silence and kind of be confused about why the audio has stopped. But on the other hand, if we put too much content in one of these legs, then uh, the user might overshoot their target destination. They might not hear all the navigation information that they need to hear in order to actually get to where they're trying to go. So they will end up wandering aimlessly. We consider the second problem, that having too much content is generally a worse experience for people because they, they end up kind of just wandering. And finally, there's an interplay between audio editing and word processing. Uh, and this, this part of it is particularly um, near and dear to my heart uh, because this was part of the dissertation work I did at UC Berkeley with Manish Agarwala. Um, so in short, speech audio is made up of words and sentences and paragraphs. It's not just some arbitrary low-level waveform. But audio editing, audio editing tools like Pro Tools, for example, will generally force the producers to manipulate the audio files at the waveform level. So we've been building a piece of software called uh, Descript 
which combines word processing, mapping, and audio editing. So here's a screenshot of Descript. So here you can see the text in the top left, the map in the top right, and the waveform timeline on the bottom. The producer of the detour can use each of these three views to do the word processing, mapping, and audio editing tasks that we've already mentioned. But in Descript, all of these tools are linked together. So the text here is inherently tied to location and to specific audio. Using these links, we can make a producer's job a lot easier. So before I dive into Descript um, and, and the, the kinds of things we enable in it, I just want to give you a quick primer on how we actually structure a detour. So a detour is made up of a series of segments, and each of these segments contains audio that we want to play for the listener. You can think of each of these segments as kind of having its own timeline, as in a traditional digital audio workstation like Pro Tools. So there are two kinds of segments. We first have stationary segments, which we show as red pins on this map. Um, and in a stationary segment, the person taking the detour is standing still or standing in a roughly confined area, and they're listening to some bit of content, but they're not actively walking around. And then we also have walking segments. So in a walking segment, it's exactly the opposite. It's some piece of content that the detour taker will hear when they're walking between two other points. So suppose the producer has written uh, this bit of text. And they wanted that, that piece of content to play when the user walks between these two points, say between this, this red point and this green point. And this is along Fisherman's Wharf. So Descript lets the producer organize the content into structured segments. These are the same segments that I mentioned before. So the producer can create segments and add the text that they want to play there. And also, based on this amount of text or audio, Descript gives the producer pacing cues in the left-hand gutter. So here, in that blue box, you can see we expect this amount of content to take around 43 seconds. And then, with this other box, it's a little light here, but that says plus three seconds, which is saying it'll take roughly three more seconds for the user to actually walk between the two points that you've uh, indicated. So in this case, it means you're good. It means the amount of content that you have is roughly the same as the amount of walking time that you have. In a case where the producer has too much content for a walking segment, the gutter will show a visual <coughs> cue of this. So you see this, this dashed red and yellow line. And where I highlight here, the blue box, it says negative one minute and 12 seconds, which is saying in this, um, in this segment, this walking segment that you've created, you have approximately one minute too much content. So the user will be at the end of that segment before, uh, before your content is finished. So because we have the producer structure the document into these segments, we can also show an overview of the entire tour. The producer can visually scan this to get a sense of the amount of walking in a tour. So if the producer just looks at the, uh, the amount of green that they see here, that's all the time that the, the user will be walking. Um, they can also get a sense of, uh, there's, there's not really an example of it, or there's a small example in this visualization, um, but the producer can also get a sense of parts of the tour that they might have too much content or too little content. But this timeline, it's not just a visualization, it's an interaction, uh, an interactive visualization. So the producer can navigate the document by scrubbing on this timeline. So it's just like a scroll bar, they can move between segments by dragging on the timeline. So as the producer edits the script, as they place their segments um, along the tour and they add their text to the different segments, Descript generates text-to-speech audio. While this doesn't sound great, as Luisa demonstrated before with that clip um, from the mammoth example, it does give the producer a sense of pacing and it lets them test out the tour in the wild before actually recording anything. So you can open Descript, lay out a path, write all the text for a tour, go out and with the Descript app, actually take the detour and see if the pacing works, see if, if it's hitting all the locations that you want to and see if the story works before you have to spend that valuable time 
and money to actually get your narrator into the recording studio and record the final audio for the tour. So here's just an example Hello. of the text to speech. And the detour. I'm Borg just. We're standing at the center of Fisherman's Wharf. So later on in the process, once, once the producer has got a good sense of what their script should be and uh, how the locations work together, she'll actually go in the studio and record, um, record the voiceover audio. When she wants to add the voiceover audio to the tour, um, she drags the file into Descript, and we use a combination of automatic speech recognition and forced alignment um, to be able to automatically detect where in the script that that voice, uh, voiceover track should go. So the user can drag that file from the media library into the script, and we know exactly where it belongs. In this case, it was at the beginning of the tour right here. And so that might be a little confusing right now, but this lets us do some really cool things. So once Descript has this aligned voiceover, uh, voiceover audio and text, we can show the playhead in the form of highlighting the currently spoken text. Um, so in a, I'll play this in a second, and you'll see that the text is highlighting exactly when those words are being spoken in the text, or in the audio. Hello, and welcome to Detour. I'm Jorge Jess. We're the next hour, you and I will walk through the Fisherman's on the corner of Jefferson and Taylor, underneath a 32-foot Fisherman's Wharf sign that's shaped like a ship's wheel. So the producer can then, nav now the producer can navigate um, playback of their tour through the text. They don't even have to look at um, the waveform timeline. And this is not just useful for navigating, it's also useful for doing some simple editing operations. For example, in this case, if the producer wanted to uh, cut out this one sentence that's describing where the person is, she can just select it and delete it, and the audio will be edited automatically. The detour. I'm Jorge Jess. Millions of people come here each year, but they rarely see the side of the wharf I'm about to show you. And they never So we're moving more in the direction of enabling those kinds of text-based audio editing operations to really limit the amount of time that the producer ever has to work with uh, the raw audio files. So it would be pretty inconvenient if you had to actually go out and walk the tour every time you tweaked it. Um, so one, one more connection we have between the different views in Descript is that we show on the map where we expect the user to be at a certain point in the tour. So during playback, pay attention to this blue dot in the map, and it will move roughly to where the user would be. We're now walking towards some of the touristy places that many locals associate with the wharf. But it wasn't always this polished. A hundred years ago, this was an industrial zone. And bit by bit, it's transformed into a tourist mecca. So by linking all three of these views, again, the, the map, the word processor, and the waveform timeline, by linking them all together, we can edit the tour in multiple ways. So I already showed you an example of how we can edit the audio via the text. Um, but we have different kinds, of, uh, different kinds of events that can happen in a tour, too. Like if you want to edit where an image will display on your screen, or where a certain music cue comes in. Um, you can add that cue to the text at a particular point, and then you can change uh, where it goes. So for example, you can drag that image event, move it to different parts of the text, and you'll see in the timeline, it changes the time that it's showing up at. And you can also move it by dragging it in the timeline, as I'm showing there. And you'll see two things that happen during this drag. Uh, first, we see the image icon moving the text in the text to its new position. So this will show again in a second. So the image icon moves around in the text as you drag it in the timeline. And second, we see an overlay of the position of the mouse in the text um, in that waveform view. So it, as you're dragging, you can look at that and see roughly where it'll end up in the text. So this reinforces to the user that all of these views are connected. and They're all linked together. And really, 
one of the design principles that we're, we're trying to work toward in building this tool is that you can really do a lot of the ed editing operations in any of the views. So Descript is an active development. Um, our producers currently use it to make tours, and we have some external producers that we're working with too um, to get a sense of how it's working. Uh, and we're hoping to launch uh, beta soon. But we've got lots of other ideas in the pipeline for what Descript will become, um, which include adding inline video footage during playback. So this is going to become more and more important for us because where we are right now, we've created a lot of detours in San Francisco, um, and we're starting to, um, to work with remote producers in other cities uh, to create tours in those cities. So right now we're working on Chicago, New York, and LA. And we're based in San Francisco, but we do want to have a lot of input in that creative process. So it'd be great if we had some way to be able to sort of preview the tour without having to fly to those cities and take the tour. So one thing we're thinking about is if you, go out, um, if you go out along the route of a tour with a GoPro or with a camera that can record like 360 footage, uh, then we can attach that video to the segments in Descript. And then as you're playing the tour back in Descript, you can also get this visual, um, visual indicator of where you are. Um, so I showed you some sort of early text-based audio editing that we're doing in Descript. So right now, essentially, you can rearrange things and delete things. But we're also going to pursue that further and really see how far we can go uh, with doing audio editing operations in the text. And lastly, we really see Descript as a general purpose digital audio workstation, something that you would use instead of Pro Tools or instead of Audition to create that radio story or to create your podcast. Uh, we think there's a lot of power in combining the text and the audio. Um, and even if you don't need the mapping tools for the, the project that you're doing, um, we think it'll have a lot of cool applications as a general purpose tool. Um, yeah, so that's what we have. And we're happy to take questions. Mm -hmm.